Hey, what's up, Reefers? Yes, it's finally here. The update that I promised you for a long time. Now, this tank has gone by a lot of names. It has gone from the macroalgae tank to the mangrove tank. And we'll talk a little bit more about the mangrove tree house doing and a little bit of the uh, care tips that I picked up along the way later on in this video. And right now, I'm mainly calling this tank the soft coral tank for a really obvious reason, because this tank is now dominated by soft corals. It's just kind of like a natural evolution of this tank. Uh, so I add more soft corals in there, they seem to be doing really well, so I added more, and they just got giants in size. For the benefit of those who may not be familiar with this tank, I just want to really quickly go over the equipment list as well as the lack of maintenance this tank needs. So for those of you who are a long time follower of this channel, number one, thank you, and number two, you can skip forward a little bit in this video to go on with the updates and some of the new things that's been happening for this tank. Diving into it, this is a 17 gallon rimless tank. There's no sump, no nothing. Is basically a glass tank and in the back I have a basically a container that simply hold the uh, auto top off sensor just so that things is a little bit neater and has a pump that pumps water from the auto top off container right here so with a small tank like this, as well as any of the reef tank, it is really important to keep your water topped off at the same level because as the water evaporates, the fresh water leaves, but salt remains in the water and you get salinity fluctuation. And that's not something that you want because the salinity level of the water dictates a lot of things. Back in the little chamber right here, I do have the XP Aqua Duetto ATO. I really like that on top off system. It keeps the level really, really well and it has an optical sensor. In terms of providing water circulation, to this little tank, I have a Ecotec Vortec MP10 in here. It has been surfacing this tank really, really well. Again, I, there's no return pump because there's no sump. The only thing that's really providing any uh, meaningful water circulation is this MP10 right here. On the wet side, I actually have one of these uh, Neat Aquatics 3D printed cage to number one, guard against fish and shrimp and coral being sucked up into the uh, wet side of the Vortec. And number two, this actually changed the flow pattern to something a little bit wider. Once again, because this is the only pump uh, or wave maker I have in this tank, so I want to make sure the flow that's coming out is wide enough. The next piece of equipment that I wish I could show you, but I actually cannot, is a Phoenix Titanium 100 watt heater. It's somewhere sitting in the back diagonally. Uh, I love the Phoenix Titanium heater simply because they're virtually indestructible in terms of uh, breakage compared to the glass heater. I've had a 30 gallon tank, one of my first reef tank, completely wiped out because one of the glass heater broke, but have not happened yet with the Phoenix Titanium heater. I love those guys. Yes, they do fail I do have a 500 watt that breaks not bricks physically but simply stop working uh, so at least we avoid the actual breakage of the heater uh, itself and the last pieces of equipment that we're gonna talk about is lights for the main lights I have a Ecotec Marine Radeon G4 Pro this is absolutely absolutely awesome lights It's plenty powerful for this tank I'm running it at 16% intensity right now this light is absolutely overkill for this tank but again I have it just sitting on the shelf so I put it to use so that is the light for the corals, but another light I have is actually for the mangrove. It is one of those standard plants grow light. Let me turn it on. This grow light is made by Spider Farmer. Uh, I bought them off of Amazon after reading all the fantastic reviews. And one thing I quickly learned while growing mangrove is that I have to not consider it as like an afterthought for the reef tank in order to be successful. In the past, I just basically tossed those uh, mangrove pots into the sump and just rely on the refugium light to grow it. It works, but it's really, really slow. And the more I read about the mangrove, the more I realize that I really need to treat it as a separate entity compared to the reef tank. It's not part of the reef tank. It just so happened that the roots grows into the reef tank, yes, but for the top portion, it's separate. So with respect to the mangrove, I have its own grow lights and it has been doing really, really well. But again, we're gonna talk a little bit more about my experience growing out this mangrove tree a little bit later on in this video. For now, we have covered all the equipments and uh, let's go dive into the update as well as a closer look to how the fish and corals are doing in this tank. I have my lovely wife holding camera. This is one of the rare occasions these days because she's always so busy. All right, all right, anyways, let's cut to the chase. So I want to give you the up-to-date reading in terms of power value in the soft coral. I keep saying that the soft coral tank get more lights than the 145 SPS tank. Top of the water where the fuzzy soft coral finger. Oh, fuck, one more time. I like that. Fuck. Okay, with passion. All right, 
So if you want to come in a little bit at the top of the water where the fuzzy finger letter is, it's about 400 par. It fluctuates between like 380 to 450. Sliding over a little bit to where the metallic green toast to it is 430, sitting firmly at 430. And coming down here a little bit, where the yellow Fiji letter is uh, acclimating, it's about 220 par. So as you can see, the whole tank, the power value is high. So people kept saying that soft coral it belongs in low lights. Well, they can survive and they, they can grow in low light, but they can also adapt to higher light. And one thing I noticed is that certain corals, like the fuzzy finger letter, if I keep the light intensity a little lower, it turns brown, it's not as pretty. Versus right now, even before, I actually dialed back the light a little bit a while back. Uh, when the light gets even brighter, the polyps turn almost white. It's absolutely beautiful. Right now, it has a slight pink brown tone to it. Uh, normally, the light is maybe even 1 to 2 percent higher. Um, Translate to par is probably 450 par or so. That's why I noticed it's the most beautiful. Um, for the metallic green toast stew, I think we're at the sweet spot. Right now, it has a nice green metallic. The stock is a little bit yellow, which is fantastic. And so I think about 420, 450 is probably a good spot. Are you zooming in my mouth again? No. <laughs> no. Is that why look, at this, look at this. Our channel is inappropriate wafer, right? Yeah, why? Look at this. What? D this angle, this angle. Come here. Come here. All right, let's dive into the corals. First one I want to talk about is this guy right here. This is a fuzzy finger letter. It is pretty much a common coral back in the days, but I guess not too many people give it too much thought and too much love. So we actually don't see it all that often these days. They usually come in a, um, a small nub like this. So it's not too impressive until they grow out to a colony size. Just like I mentioned earlier in this video, if you give it enough light, the polyps do turn more pale or more white, which looks fantastic. Looks a lot cleaner. Similar to zinnias, like the zinnias in the back wall right here, if I give them enough light, they turn more pale, more white, and they're still healthy. It just looks a lot cleaner and neater in my opinion. And I noticed that if I give them enough flow, they get a little bit more fuzzy. As you can see right here, the area that's in direct flow. Uh, right now, it's early in the morning, so the flow is not strong. In the afternoon, when the flow of the MP10 really kicks up, I have a different settings for uh, morning and afternoon. That's when you see the fuzziness of the polyps. It looks absolutely gorgeous. So that is the fuzzy finger letter. A really common corals, but if you give them a, enough chance and also a good environment, they do make for a really, really impressive centerpiece of the tank as well. Side notes, the clownfish absolutely love going in and out of the uh, fuzzy finger letter. They almost treat it like an enemy. And um, it's interesting because sometimes you just catch them just laying among the tentacle, not moving at all, just sleeping in there. So it's really cool to see. I'll see if there's a chance to show you guys that later on in this video. So listen, one thing that I noticed is that there is a lot of parallels between hobbies. Some reef aquarium keepers are also into houseplants. Some are gamers and some like to fish. Today's video sponsor, Fishing Clash, happens to tackle the last two. And it's thanks to video sponsor like this that I can continue to create videos that I love for you. Fishing Clash is a fun and absolutely beautiful fishing simulation game for iOS and Android, with the most realistic graphics I've ever seen in mobile games. This game virtually transports you away from your busy life, maybe with two kids, to a famous fishing spot like the Mekong River or the Great Barrier Reef. And there, you could peacefully fish by yourself or have some competitive fun against other players. Want to support this channel and give it a try? Great to hear. I'm positive that you'll enjoy it. And quick tips from someone who's already got a quite few hours under his wings, lures are the most important part of the game, as the level of bait determines how big the fish you're going to catch. You gain new levels by improving the lures, and you improve them by defeating boss fish in the fisheries. Power-ups are consumables that temporarily buff your stats, and weight gains is something that you want in this game, as it helps you keep bigger fish. And while playing, be sure to upgrade your rods, as each rod has its own characteristics. And finally, you can also join a clan when you're ready for some cooperative play or exciting battle against other fishing clans. Sounds exciting? Download the game by using my link in the video description below, or scan the QR code you see on screen, and take part in the St. Patrick's Day event. Use my special gift code, REFER, to get a $20 value reward for free. With my gift code, you also get an unique avatar, one mythical lure card, 50 luck power-ups, and 30 weight power-ups to help you catch even bigger fish. Thank you again to today's sponsor, Fishing Clash, and let's get back to the video. 
The next coral I want to talk about is this metallic green toadstool leather. Once again, this is not a rare or like super expensive coral by any means. I see this one pops up pretty often locally actually. And this one has just been growing really, really well to the point that it's actually permanently outside of the water, at least uh, this corner right here. And that gets me a little bit worried. I'm afraid that this may rot and start a bacteria infection to, and it will take down the rest of the coral. So far, it has not happened yet. By terms of care, I do notice that they do have this nice, nice green metallic color when you give them enough light. And you also notice that uh, underneath the tentacles, the, uh, the stock is almost like a orange in color when you give them high, enough highlights. Uh, when the light is a little bit lower, intensity is a little bit lower, it's more like a pinkish color, not as striking as what we have here. A nice metallic green toadstool leather. And once again, this is not something rare. Uh, I see this one pops up locally pretty often. The clownfish also loves to kind of nestle in between these uh, little foldings. So it's really cool to see. The final soft coral that I want to touch on today is this right here. I've talked about this coral in my previous video and this is the infamous Fiji yellow leather coral that does not seem to make it into this hobby that often these days. With this coral, you see the smaller tank size of the 17 gallon is really cramming a style. It has the potential to open up even more. When I first got this coral, maybe two months ago, uh, it first acclimated into the 135 before I moved it here. It was opened up, the polyps is fuzzy. It looks fantastic. Apologize for the noise, by the way. Our baby Nina is here hanging out with daddy and mommy. The intention for the Yellow Fiji ladder is uh, to test out a theory that uh, Mr. Jake Adam and Mark pointed out is to use green lights to bring out the yellow coloration. And we're not talking about just color rendition, it's to bring out the innate color uh, because once again, this is the Fiji yellow ladder, a yellow Fiji ladder, and they're supposed to be canary yellow. There's actually a really interesting story behind this particular coral that I shared, uh, I think two videos ago. In a nutshell, the story is that I actually used to own this coral maybe like five years ago. I sold it locally as like a piece this big and then um, a while back earlier this year I was looking for a Fiji yellow leather and it came back so I was able to purchase this or trade for this coral back uh, from a local reefer uh, much appreciated to him fortunately I have this leather down in a 135 gallon tank with the mixed reef but the intention has always been moving this coral to the uh, softy tank ups here uh, this way it won't have any a chance of releasing potential chemical warfare material into the 135 that will inhibit the growth of the SPS especially because I was seeing the 135 was going downhill something is bothering the tank so I figured I'll just move this up here a little bit prematurely and thankfully in the last two months or so it has adjusted really really well except for again this area is pressed up against the glass so I think sooner rather than later I'll be fragging it uh, one small piece is going to go back into 145 and then another piece is supposed to go to my good friend Daniel in New York over the period of two months I have been slowly increasing the green channel of the Radian, uh, Radian G4 to see if it makes any impact to the coloration. It is an ongoing project, so we will see how it goes and I'll keep you guys updated. In terms of corals, those three are the big three of this tank. And of course, I have other corals like the Gorgonian, which technically is not a coral. And I have a bunch of these um, green singularas. I have some clove coral that I was hoping would do well, but not enough light and flow is getting to the spot. So they are just kind of wasting away. I will need to move them. I do also have other types of toast stew here. And I even have a Japanese deep water back there as well. But these guys are not getting as much light as the ones up here because they are being shaded. And the flow for the most part goes this way and goes around. So there's not much flow down here. So the bottom portion is not the most ideal. I tried growing some zoas, which seems to be doing okay. I tried growing some mushroom um, and I actually had a nice piece of jawbreaker down here, but I think there's just not enough flow and um, the light to sustain it. And I think it just floated off somewhere in the back. I have not had a chance to go in and dig and try to find it, but it's back there somewhere. In terms of fish, I have a pair of clownfish here. This is a pair of clownfish that have been with me for about eight years at this point. They originally came from Blue Ribbon Aquatics. It's a local LFS. Uh, I think they, they were ordered from Sea and Reef. They're known as the Da Vinci Clown. And in terms of coloration, the mocha. 
So to combine them, they're known as the Mocha Vinci Clamfish. And they are, I think this one is called the Great A, and this is Extreme based on the pattern. Great A, the second bar does not connect to the third bar. Extreme is the one that connects all the way. Back in the days, designing clownfish is all the hypes. These days, they're dime a dozen for the most part, but I absolutely love the pattern because of how natural they look, but they do bring a, a splash of creativity versus uh, more natural clownfish. They're all great, but I just love these pair. I absolutely love them, and I'm glad that I'm able to keep them in my computer room where I see them a little bit more often than in 135. Now, one worry I had with the clownfish is whether they're gonna jump because this is a rimless tank. And a lot of times when fish jump is that they get spooked at night and they swim against the wall, against the corner, and it goes straight up. If your tank has those black rims, like those uh, Peco tank, or if you have a Euro brace, then usually that will prevent the fish from swimming out. They're not even jumping out, they're swimming out. Versus a rimless tank like this, if they get spooked, they swim long. If they're a strong swimmer, they slide right out. So that's one of my biggest fear. But seeing that these are clownfish and seeing how happy they are and attached they are to the uh, fuzzy finger ladder, it seems like whenever they get scared, the first thing to do is dive into the coral versus going against the side of the glass like a lot some of the other fish does. Uh, so I, I was like, okay, you know what? I'm also in this room enough that it's a risk that I'm willing to take. Hopefully I don't get to regret this, but so far after two months or so, it has been working out, or two and a half months at this point. Every time they get spooked, they don't get spooked often because people walk around here a lot. I'm always here making like uh, ruckus. We'll see Leon here smashing the glass and stuff like that. They don't get spooked much. If they get spooked, they go inside the coral. So that gives me the confidence to say that, hey, maybe this will be okay. Now, besides the fish, we also have some inverts in this tank. It's not many, but there are some. We got a peppermint shrimp right here. Leon actually picked this one out. I had a little bit of a Aptasia issue in this tank. That's why I want to introduce something that eats Aptasias. I didn't want to do nudibranch because the, the specific diets means that once the Aptasia is taken care of, they'll starve to death. So uh, I went with a peppermint and Leon helped me pick this out from uh, Fantastic, another LFS. And down here, we got a star Scarlet Hermit Crab. I only have one, I think. I don't think it's really doing that much, but Scarlet Hermit is one of my favorite inverts in terms of a cleanup crew, so I had to add one. I also have maybe two or three small emerald crab in this tank as well because I was having some bubble algae issues. I, in some way, for this tank, I feel like the bubble algae is a blessing in disguise because, as you know, these algae takes up the excess nutrient in this tank and then um, it's export if you can take care of the algae as well. So the ammo crabs in there cleaning up the uh, bubble algae, I do notice that th this tank has almost no bubble algae at this point. I do see one or two here, larger ones, but for the most part, I believe the crabs have been doing a fantastic job, or maybe it is the mangrove that's uptaking all the excess nutrients uh, that's being produced by the fish and all the food being fed. And that's actually a nice segue to talk about mangroves and some of the things I've done to keep this mangrove happy in this uh, small volume of water. So like a lot of people during the pandemic, I really picked up plants and I sucked at it. <laughs> I sucked at it. I have a moderate amount of success, but for the most part, I feel like I'm not, I'm not that great at it. Real quick, we got some Pi Constellation. This is a new leaf, which is fantastic. And we have some uh, Monstera Elbow. As you can tell, I really like the Monstera. I like the shape. I like the, uh, the coloration. We got some freak, I forget what it's called. And we got some that's not doing well. So as you can see, I have moderate success in terms of plants. Oh, here's another one I really like too. I think it's called a Billiton. I'm not sure how to pronounce it. Uh, just like coral name, sometimes I kind of butcher the name, but uh, if you know, you know. Uh, this one has been really hardy for me and a good grower, but uh, the best grower for me so far is definitely the mangrove tree right here. So this mangrove I picked up about, was it four years, four and a half years at this point from a tank breakdown. And during that time, this tree was about two and a half years old from the original owner. And the original owner had it in the back overflow chamber of a 180 gallon tank. It's not getting anything specific, not like here where it gets its own lights. It's just living off of the uh, reef lights. And it, it has a nice root system. It has a couple branches. It was good. It's two and a half years old. In terms of this tank, it has always been circling around the mangrove. The mangrove is the main character. So this is a red mangrove. And some of the things I picked up is that number one, like I mentioned, treat it as a separate entity from the tank. It deserves 
its own light. Uh, that's one of the main thing because if the light is too close to the leaves, you burn the leaves, they'll crisp up, they'll turn brown. And the second thing that really helped me grow this tree out is nutrients. Of course, you have nutrient from your fish, from feeding corals, but once your tree gets a certain size, it has roots going into the sand, you need to start putting root taps. And root taps, uh, you can look for those for freshwater fish. They're basically little pills and it got a little fertilizer in there. You shove the roof taps into the sand and as they melt, the, the, the nutrient will come out and then the roots will be absorbed. So root tap is another thing that I add for the mangrove, maybe every three months or so. You don't have to do it often. And finally, I also once in a while squirt some liquid fertilizer and I do it really haphazardly. I have some of these guys, Thrive Plus from back in my high tech uh, freshwater planted days. I've I've done that for a year or two. So I just randomly squirt some in and sometimes I have chato growth. It's also basically um, just liquid fertilizer for chatos. Um, if you grow chatos in your uh, refugium. And the reason I started doing that is because last year there's a stretch of maybe a month or so. This mangrove tree started dropping leaves. It dropped like 12 leaves near the bottom and I was freaking out. And some people say that, oh, don't worry. That's just a normal process of a tree growing. They'll drop the older leaves. But the fact that it dropped like 12 leaves straight away within the span of like two weeks just freaked me out. So I started putting fertilizer in. I want to make sure the magnesium it's uh, at the level it should be because mangrove also uptake magnesium from your reef tank as well. So that's one element you should check. So after I started putting uh, root taps into the sand, it just, the whole thing just turned around. Now, the other question a lot of people ask is like, do you need to mist your mangrove tree? Uh, according to Mr. Julian Sprung, who is the master of red mangrove, is that you do not need to mist your uh, red mangrove. The reason for people to recommend misting your mangrove is more for like black mangrove, white mangrove, where they secrete the salt from the leaves and you need the uh, water to, cut or the mist to kind of rinse off the salt. However, according to Mr. Julian Sprung, the red mangrove keep the salt from the water out by using pressure meaning that they keep a different set of pressure from the root system so the water cannot even go, uh, the, the salt cannot even enter the, uh, the tree system. So that's how they keep the pressure. So for the most part, you do not need to mist uh, your red mangrove if you're within a normal environment. Now the other consideration is that if you live in a higher altitude area where it's just naturally dry, there's like no humidity in the air, then yeah, then you probably want to mist your trees. But if you're just living a regular, regular level, you're not up in the mountains, stuff like that, and you have like a standard humidity, for the most part, you should be okay. One consideration you have for the red mangrove is you do not want to damage its roots at all when you're moving. For example, at one, at one of these days, I will have to move it away from the 17 gallon tank because it's starting to grow. When I move it, I want to be super, super careful in terms of not damaging the roots because like what we mentioned before, uh, the red mangrove use pressure to keep the salt out of the system. So if the root is damaged, then it's compromised and it won't have the ability to keep the salt out and it's going to die. So one thing that Mr. Julian Sprung uh, recommend is that if you happen to damage your roots, put the mango tree in fresh water for now. Uh, fresh water, you do not need to acclimate. You can convert or you can simply place a mangrove tree that had been growing a reef tank directly in fresh water. However, when it's time to move the mangrove from fresh water to salt water, give it like two to three weeks of acclimation. You cannot just go straight to 1.025 or 1.026. Uh, it's gonna stress out, it's gonna die. So you need to um, you need to acclimate when it comes from fresh water to salt water, but not from salt water to fresh water. And bonus point, mangroves supposedly actually grow really well in fresh water, much better than uh, salt water, simply because they don't need to use the extra energy to keep the salt out. So that's something to think about if you really wanna as quickly as possible grow out a mangrove tree. All right, if you're still watching so far, thank you so much for hanging on. Just like in my previous videos, what I like to do is feed the tank as I'm signing off. And I realized I did not talk about the maintenance of this tank at all. This tank is basically zero maintenance for the most part. I do a water change. <laughs> when was the last time I did a water change of this tank? Three months ago? And then before that, probably in three or four months. So this tank is just like so, 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 so low maintenance. I'm not sure if it is due to the fact that I have a mangrove growing out of it. Um, mangrove is not that known to be efficient nutrient uptake here. Is that a word, uptaker? But for the most part, this tank has been super low maintenance. And whenever I do a water change, I maybe change out this much water. 
uh, because of all the uh, the fish and the coral, well, not the fish, the fish wasn't there uh, for the last water change, but because of how durable all these corals or how adaptable soft corals are, I'm not that careful. Um, so each time I change water, I just change a bunch because I know that it'll be far and few between. And during this period of time, I tried to suck out as much of the detritus as possible to keep it as clean as possible. Because I, while I do appreciate some nitrate, and phosphate in this water. I don't want to make sure. I want to make sure I don't have like a factory in there just creating phosphate and nitrates. But that's pretty much it. I feel like for a lot of people, myself included, this is kind of like the perfect reef tank. It's simple. It's uh, it looks nice when filled in. When it's sparse, it doesn't look great. But when you give the corals the uh, proper care they need, and give them a chance to grow out without cutting it up too often, they look fantastic. And again, the maintenance is almost non-existent, and it's also really affordable. While the light itself is expensive, and I'm using it because I have it in the shelf, you can totally use like something like a Viper Spectra. That's like two hundred dollars light, and it has way more output than you need for a tank like this. And there are just way more lighting options these days that are really budget friendly and just equally powerful. You may give up a little control sometimes, but for the most part, they will do what you need to do. Especially if you're setting up a tank like this. This is a really nice budget option, really nice bang for the bucks for what you get. But of course, if you want to venture in the world of colorful SPS, well, it's doable as well. I do have this little forest fire digitata that's kind of hanging on, but in terms of coloration, it is not the best at the moment. But uh, with some tweaking, there's potential there as well. But for a soft coral tank, for I think um, just everyday hobbyists, I think this is a really nice option. And down the road, maybe I'll do a cost breakdown. Like if I were to set up a tank like this, what kind of equipment I'll use? and uh, how much would, they, would the bill be running up to. I know the soft coral tank aesthetic is not for everyone. What would be your preference? Would you go with a low cost soft coral tank or a medium cost mixed reef or a high cost SPS tank? While I want to give you guys an update on this tank, there's still a lot of things I have not touched on in this video, even though it's quite long already. So if you have any questions regarding this system or anything else you want to see, go ahead, leave it in the comments. I'll try to answer as best as I could and maybe spawn it into a separate video. All right, yeah, I really need to go. I hope you guys enjoyed this video about the mangrove slash soft core tank. If you have any questions or comments, leave it in the comment section below. I'll try my best to answer it. Also, if you want to try out a mobile game, be sure to download Fishing Clash. Use my code Reefer for some free gifts. And if you're enjoying the game, in the pinned comment down below, feel free to share your heaviest catch. Signing off, see you guys next video. Pool startup, it's really really quiet and I was expecting it to be like super loud, but this is not bad at all.